Welcome to another session of SI Virtual. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, look at a patient who is 79 years old, and uh, we believe he has instant restenosis uh, of the LED. He had an LED stent a year ago. It, interestingly, was not image-guided uh, PCI at that time. First thing I'm going to do is uh, take you through the uh, transradial uh, access. Everybody does their transradials differently. Sort of learn to do it the old-fashioned way, where... Uh, I mean, if you don't use um, ultrasound guidance, that is. Um, where I will go through and through the vessel. You see that blowback. And then um, as I retract my catheter, simply advancing the wire. And I think you get a tactile sense if you're going into a small little branch. You don't want to keep pushing, obviously. Uh, but I, I think this is maybe the older fashioned way of doing it. I actually uh, <laughs> learned to do the transradial technique. Uh, we did it in training uh, back with Bill O'Neill somewhat at Beaumont, but then uh, Sunil Rao uh, from Duke obviously uh, re-energized our interest in transradial as he has uh, really been a, a spectacular advocate for the transradial. Um, so now we've done our, uh, we've done our, uh, our diagnostic uh, uh, procedure. Why don't we go through the films? Um, this is the right coronary. You can see a little bit of disease, maybe at the ostium of the uh, posterior lateral branch. But what is striking, go two pictures forward. What is striking to us when you do the RAO imaging, uh, you see septocollaterals uh, going up to, not quite reaching uh, the stented segment of the LED, but it does suggest to us that there is some disease of the LED. Go to the next picture. And I think those, the, these next pictures really tell the story. We have um, uh, high-grade disease, instant disease in that, uh, in that LED. A little surprising, this was a 3-5 uh, stent is my understanding, not, uh, not performed under image-guided conditions. Go forward. I'm also, uh, go next. Yeah, I'm also seeing something next. And the, maybe the ostium of that LED or distal main go forward. And there you can see there's overlap of the circumflex. So what we want to do, go next, is really give cranial angulation to pull the circumflex off the LED. Next picture is an LAO crane. And now you see it a little bit more completely. It's a nice picture. Now go to the next picture. Next picture is going to be a spider view. It's a little difficult to really, really get a clean spider. But it does suggest that there's something in that, uh, in that very proximal LED. And come to the next picture. And this is an AP caudal. So I think the smart money right now, we're going to wire uh, the vessel. Um, probably going to give a little touch up to that maybe with a 2 non-compliant balloon just so that we can get our OCT, um, our OCT device down the, uh, down the LED. Okay, why don't we get our wires? Beautiful. Give me both wires. Chris. So what we've done, as you can see, is we've got uh, our wire through the lesion in the LED. It was really kind of challenging to do that. Uh, we've also, because there may be osteal disease, I tend to, I got a seven and a half French uh, catheter in, uh, so there is no downside to protecting the circ. Uh, we had a little damping of the pressure waveform, so I, I think, and now the waveform looks great. So what I'm gonna do is protect both uh, branches. Pratik, uh, good, good technique uh, to use to protect both branches if you're worried about plaque shift going back and forth. Always, I think whenever you're working near the left main, distal left main, I think it's always good to have two wires in. In case you have plaque shift, you don't have to uh, worry about having to traverse that with the, with the new wire. 
Great. Especially how difficult it was to wire in the first place. Bimmel's here. Uh, he's going to be our OCT guru again. Uh, give me a 2-0 balloon. Bimmel, I don't think my OCT is going to go through that tight lesion. I agree. Uh, is it okay to use a 2-0 uh, NC balloon Absolutely. on this? Absolutely, okay. yeah. Restore flow Great. and then see if the... Yeah, he's goes. having... That's a good point. Uh, if you go to the cranial view... Thank you, Pratik. If you go to the cranial view and you can just see uh, what's going on here, just having, look at, just having that wire in is limiting flow. This is a tight lesion. Could I ask you to go to the LAO crane, please, so we can see it, the lesion. We saw it a little bit better in the LAO crane. Let's see if we can restore some flow. So we're going in with a 2-O-N-C balloon. Here's our balloon coming down to the site of the lesion. Go ahead. It's right at like the distal border uh, of that LED stent. There it is right there, going up to, and I don't want to uh, over dilate it or anything. Uh, that's why I want to use the, um, just four, six, eight. I'm just trying to use this to restore flow so we're in a stable situation and we can do OCT and down and go ahead and give me another inflation, go up to four, six, eight. Tracy does a lot of cases with me. Sometimes she knows what I wanna do before I know what I wanna do. Go down. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is just leave this balloon out there right now because we had some damping of the pressure waveform and just having the balloon in there helps to prevent further damping. And let's see. Yep, there we go, now we have flow. Wow, what a tight lesion. Yeah. Just having the wire down, you can fluoro save that and then show it again. Just having the wire down uh, limited flow into the LED and just having dilated it that much made a big difference. Do you do yeah. that often, uh, Bimmo, when you're doing OCT? I, I do that all the time. And what I would suggest in this case, because you could see the lesion still tight, um, the OCT catheter is going to be potentially uh, occlusive, a little, uh, occlusive mm -hmm. there. So I'd probably use a 2-5 balloon there, go soft, and then OCT. Okay. So well, that, let, that will make sure that we it. get a good run. May I have a 2-5 NC balloon? And Bimmel, I have, and Pratik, you jump in here as well. I've just gotten used to using uh, NC balloons uh, pretty regularly uh, on... Uh, when I'm doing something with instant disease. Uh, I mean, I think there's other choices like scoring balloons. Obviously there's the uh, Wolverine cutting balloon from Boston Scientific. Uh, I've used that a lot. Uh, are you guys going qu more quickly to NC balloons? I think, you know, uh, when you use imaging, it tells you kind of the pathology of the instant restenosis. And it depends on whether, you know, if it's instant restenosis and if, especially if it's neoatherosclerosis, I think then oftentimes balloon inflations would be ungratifying to help modify the lesion. And so I think imaging is very important prior to deciding what strategy you're going to use because oftentimes instant rotablator or laser atherectomy may give you more bang for your buck, even over scoring balloons. And, and so I think that's why imaging before deciding any strategy, I think is the best approach. Yeah. What do you think, Bimmel? I absolutely agree. I think uh, more than 80% of cases, it's NIH or neo intimal hyperplasia. But the rest of the cases, if you have some significant degree of neoatherosclerosis, then you run the risk of more dissection and needing more stents. So that, that would be the only kind of case where trying a compliant first and then going to a non-compliant may. You can Maybe also beneficial. see, you can also see guys that distally there, you know, these vessels are a little bit torturous and we have a wire distally and that wire is causing some uh, distal spasm. Again, With a just, balloon. Yeah, 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 just again, just having this balloon in is occlusive. So I think you're exactly. right. Yeah. I think the OCT definitely would have caused uh, occlusive, uh, you know, uh, limitation of flow in the vessel. Go ahead up to two, four six, eight, ten. And Bimmel, this isn't going to change what we see. A two and a half balloon is not going to change what we see on, Correct. on OCT. Yeah, the pathology is still going to be the same. And sometimes yeah. if your pressure allows, 
It's always good practice too, because catheters can induce spasm to give maybe 50 micrograms sure. of, of nitro okay. down the LAD we'll, we'll before imaging. That. We don't have tons of pressure. Yeah. And in fact, four, six, eight. In fact, Bimmel, and uh, down. In fact, Bimmel, when we gave the trans, the, the radial cocktail, yeah. I, I used a small dose of nitro and Vratmil, and we were running pressures in the 80s I see. at first. So, yeah. uh, you know, there's, um, I, I think, boy, I'd love to use something, but I don't know if we have enough uh, hemodynamic uh, room to do that. Sure. Okay, so um, now I think the next thing for us to do is to set up the OCT and let's, let's OCT this thing. Absolutely. Again, so we have our OCT catheter in place. Tracy's gonna stabilize it, make sure uh, that we don't pull it back. Um, gonna clear my catheter. Uh, is that good position, Bimmer, or would you like me in a little deeper? No, I think, I think that's good I think position, good. yeah. Bimmer, I wanna pay attention to that very uh, proximal LAD when we do this. Okay, shall we do a run? You ready? Yes. So here we go. We're going to do our OCT run. There she be. That's, that's really good at pacification. That's nice. Good. Okay, so uh, Bimmel Savni uh, is going to run the pictures. Why don't you tell us what you see uh, so that you can give us some direction yeah. on what we need to do. What are you doing Absolutely. with the uh, markers now there? So we're uh, using the co-registration system. So it's nice, um, usually the software will um, uh, first pay attention and put the dots on the wire. So then the wire then co-registers with the actual OCT catheter and then overlays on the angiographic uh, picture and mm -hmm. that takes a few seconds to, uh, to to finish, and when you agree that's where the co-reg is, uh, we'll accept that. And then as we play the OCT, you could see that previous place stent. So I always like looking at the lumen profile first, and you could see that hourglass image. And we'll stop it there kind of in the, in the mix of that um, the lesion there where, where the, the, the slender part of the hourglass. And if we go, as we played through it, what you see is the prior stent and the plaque there or the, the fibrosis there appears bright um, yellow. And so what that indicates is a high level of NIH, neo-intimal hyperplasia. Um, that's pretty pathognomonic of what most uh, restenosis that we see. And then you can also see near the stent edge, and I'm going to have Savni kind of point that out, um, in the lesion still, but at the outer edges of the stent where it's darker, um, uh, you have neo-intimal ath uh, uh, ath atherosclerosis there. So you have a mixed reason why to have restenosis. Uh, the majority of this, this is NIH or neo intimal hyperplasia. So this really wasn't a poorly placed stent. I made the point at the beginning that it was not utilizing image guidance. This just is a, a very aggressive uh, neo intimal response to the stent? That's what it appears to be. Um, you know, we can always go back to the proximal edge there and size. And so this stent was, was a 3.5, and it was probably post-dilated, maybe 3.5 mm -hmm. to 4.0. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. We can measure here um, right where that catheter is, uh, Savni Perfect, right there. Um, there's a lot of disease there, uh, even though that lumen's big, so we can do a lumen to lumen. Here it's, it measures at 3.27 um, uh, along the, the longest axis and a little bit shorter on the, the shorter axis. So. Based on imaging, if that was a fresh lesion, we would have picked a 3.5 millimeter stent, which we did uh, a year ago uh, in this patient as well. So that appears to be uh, the correct uh, sizing, even if imaging wasn't used last time. And then the one other thing we wanna make sure uh, with this run is whether there is osteal disease that we're seeing to some degree on angiography in some views. Um, in the longitudinal views, when you have the red dots, the red dots indicate where a 
uh, branch comes off. So right there where the uh, red dot is, that first red dot is where the left main bifurcates into the LAD and the circumflex. If we go past the confluence right there, we can get an area measurement. Let's see what that error measurement is. The area measurement of the osteal LAD appears to be 5.5 millimeter squared. Leave it alone. So it is not significant. Um, Leave it alone. Uh, angi by, no, by, by anatomic imaging. or imaging. What about the left main? Go into the left main now. There we go. So that's a very distal left main. Looks great. And it looks good. And, you know, this kind of talks to a lot of people. Definitely in the osteal left main may be hard to image with OCT. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but the mid to distal left main, you could see perfectly. There's with no OCT. reason if you don't have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, if you don't have osteal LAD disease, there's no reason not to utilize OCT if, if that's your mode of choice, correct? Exa exactly. I just, exactly. This, the detail, yeah. the precision and the detail that you get from this is spectacular. So I'm gonna ask Pratik and Bimmel, does this information tell you uh, what strategy to use? Am I just gonna uh, balloon and go? Am I gonna balloon and stent? Am I gonna, going to use like a Wolverine uh, cutting balloon uh, by itself? Am I gonna use a, you know, a, a scoring device and stent? Am I going to atherectomize? Pratik, what, is this, what does this suggest well, based to Based on uh, Bimmel's analysis, I think that using a scoring balloon here may be the best, uh, best way to treat that. The Certainly a way hyper to treat it. Yeah, yeah. a way yeah. to treat it. I don't think it requires a rotational atherectomy based on the fact that it's basically hyperplasia, not atherosclerosis. So I think uh, trying to get a nice uh, you know, plaque modification with the, with the Wolverine cutting balloon, for example, uh, may give you the, the best bang for your buck here. What would you do, uh, what would you do, uh, Bimmel? I absolutely agree. I think, you know, what we're missing this day and age, some people use laser for NIH, um, but we haven't necessarily seen, f you know, anecdotally fantastic cases right. regarding that. What you want to do is uh, provide a mechanism that's going to give you the best expansion. So starting with something that may... Um, uh, expand this NIH, uh, uh, whether it's a, a sculpting balloon or a, a scoring balloon, I think is a good way to start. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not overwhelmed by the uh, either anecdotally or uh, the, uh, the the published uh, information on Roto for this type of thing. Uh, if uh, there were other markers. Uh, of why we have disease, or if it was extending, there was calcium and it was extending beyond the borders of the stent, then that might be something that might to push me to roto. I would use a Wolverine. So based on what you measured, what's, and, and incidentally, that's a great name yeah. for a <laughs> I device. agree with that. Yeah. That's a great, you're talking to yeah. two people, <laughs> th or three people who spent time uh, in Michigan. So, um, so what, what size would you use? Would so, you use a 3.0 or go right to 3.5? You know, what I would do, we know that stent was a 3.5 in there, so it's probably reasonable to go 3.5. I agree with what that. What you probably want to do is um, cover uh, some of that disease distally. Um, okay. and, and, and this thing you see here, um, you know, the OCT is picking up part of the stented area, but I believe that lesion is in a stented area as well. You can use your distal reference segment to tell you exactly what balloon, what stent you're going to be okay. using. Okay. So we can go back to that OCT run, um, and I'm going to have Savni just go to that distal kind of, you want to get an area that's somewhat normal. Now you're in a stented area, so it's not going to be normal itself. And then we can get a diameter there. And since we're going to use a, uh, you can actually see the EEL, which is fantastic, uh, for more than 180 degrees arc. The diameter there is 3.81. And so um, hmm. there I would use, you downsize a quarter and use a 3.5. All right, now I, I do need to say something. Um, it seems like I've done all the burdensome heavy lifting on this case while the two of you have uh, <laughs> been the thinkers and the, uh, so uh, Pratik, come on in here. 
I'm gonna I'm going to turn things over to you and and come and take a breather here. So we have a 35 uh, Wolverine cutting balloon, great device. I did my first cutting balloon back in 1995 when this was a product of IVT or interventional technologies. And we did a, a lot of imaging uh, with this. Uh, in fact, and published in the Journal of Invasive Cardiology some of the uh, some of the observations that we saw and, uh, and, and what we demonstrated is that uh, you can really see the remnants of those atheratomes in a de novo lesion uh, and actually in instant lesions uh, and it uh, really uh, uh, makes a great bit of difference. This is like uh, we used to call it microsurgical incision with the Wolverine balloon, and that's ex or with the original uh, cutting balloon, and that's exactly what this does. Uh, you saw that uh, the uh, there was rebound and recoil of the lesion right. uh, for a second there, and we had a drop off of anti-grade flow uh, distally, and now he's got the cutting balloon. Uh, it used to be with the cutting balloon uh, that the uh, the therapeutic. Uh, use was going up slowly, but this is an instant lesion. I don't go up slowly anymore. I think it would just uh, dilate yeah, it. I agree with that. So I don't know if you pull back and change the direction of the atherotomes, but that's kind of what I've done here. Okay, just I, I don't know uh, that it does that, but you really can see, uh, and I've never done it with OCT, and it'd be nice to do it with OCT on a de novo lesion, but you can really see the remnants of the atherotome, you know, microsurgical mm -hmm. incision yeah. on ultrasound. And we published some great stuff. In fact, I was uh, honored to have uh, published some of the early stuff on this uh, with, uh, with Marty Leon. Uh, and uh, boy, we, we really did uh, set the pace for uh, the use of, um, of the, uh, what was called the Barrett surgical cutting balloon uh, back in the day. And it's been iterated. One of the iterations that Bob Reese and I walked on, I worked on, was to uh, to make the atherotome more flexible by cutting gaps, if you will, in the base of the atherotome. Boy, that looks spectacular! In the base of the atherotome, where it is attached uh, to the balloon itself, and they uh, made it more flexible. Uh, and they've made more iterations to it that really make this a nice device. Yeah. I think that looks spectacular. Okay, that looks so great. I, I think that we need to re-stent this. And I think we need to be, I would say, pretty aggressive with our post-stent dills. Uh, what do you think? I do, and I think one of the nice things about OCT is getting the stented length, which oftentimes, you know, you may waste contrast if you don't use imaging, trying to get the, the right stent using a, you know, some sort of sizing balloon. But with OCT, if you have a nice run, you can yeah. get the exact length you need and you yeah. don't really have to waste so what's contrast. Our, I agree with that. So let's go back to the pre, um, uh, angioplasty OCT. We'll go to our distal reference uh, segment there, uh, which is uh, just distal to, uh, to our lesion. We're getting, we made an EL measurement there, which was um, the diameter there is 3.81, and we're gonna down, downside a quarter, so the diameter of your stent is gonna be a 3.5. Mm -hmm. And then lengthwise, we're, we're gonna make sure we cover the re the, the lesion and go to a, um, a normal part of the segment. Uh, we'll go in there to the proximal. Um, so there's a lesion there very proximally, but we probably wanna stay away uh, potentially kind of from the proximal um, uh, LAD. Yeah, Don't course. wanna cause a dissection and probably stay within the stented area. So I would probably stent right before those branches come out there. Um, and let's see what type of length we get there. If we can zoom in to that OCT so I can see it a little bit better. Oh, the eye's coming. There we go. So the length there that you're getting is, you know, in the 23, 24 millimeter mark, I think. Yeah. Okay, so. And, and the proximal segment there, when we do a, um, a diameter, we can already pick out our post dilatation balloon for the the proximal part of the stent. So, right there, our diameter is. We're measuring it right now. It's going to be 3.47. We can um, 
upsize that by 0.5, so it's going to be a 4.0 balloon that you're going to post dilate the proximal part of that segment. Okay, so on our last case today, we used Zions and it worked beautifully. Uh, our lab has both Zions and uh, Synergy on the shelf, so let's use a Synergy. Let's use a 3.5 by 24 Synergy. Uh, extraordinarily deliverable stent, works beautifully. We've had great success with this. And right now we are running uh, out of this institution the uh, Syniva study, which is looking at patients for high bleeding risk uh, and abbreviating their DAPT to 30 days uh, with mandatory uh, intravascular ultrasound. So these patients all are high bleeding risk patients and uh, we're performing intravascular ultrasound, then implanting a Synergy stent uh, and if they meet all of the criteria of, uh, of post-stent dilatation by ultrasound, they're all getting their, um, their uh, DAPT discontinued to monotherapy after only 30 days. So uh, we, we do uh, a lot of work with the Synergy stent and it works fantastic. And some of the Asian data is remarkable. Oh. Uh, they use imaging in uh, more than 85, 90% of cases. and and not only in higher bleeding risk patients, but they've been doing shorter DAP uh, right. for a little bit longer. Right, there's, there's actually tons of data uh, with the Synergy stent on uh, abbreviated uh, DAP from the senior trial uh, uh, and others. But I, I think what uh, one of the d trials that I thought was very provocative, and it was really uh, a thought provoking proof of concept was a study that we discussed uh, about a, well, I think it was a year ago, uh, 200 patients at nine Brazilian sites, and it was antiplatelet monotherapy only. Wow. And uh, it was, uh, they implanted a synergy stent, high use of imaging, and the patients were never exposed to aspirin. And I think it, it says two things. Number one, that we're, we're getting away from dual therapy more and more. And the agent that we are probably eliminating more is often the uh, yeah. is, is, is the, the aspirin. aspirin. Yeah. So this was 200 patients uh, that, uh, again, had only antiplatelet monotherapy after a synergy stent and the stent thrombosis rate was zero. Great. And there was one MACE event, I think it was an instant restenosis or something. So uh, I, this is a workhorse stent that uh, we've had a lot of uh, good, good experience with. Yeah. All right, I, like, I think you're in a good position there. You know, the nice thing with the OCT co-reg is you know where the lesion is, you know where your proxy, your distal is on your um, OCT software there. So you can just match that up with your live image and yeah. know exactly where you need to be. All right, go to work. Yeah, ready? Puff it. I might, will you want to come back a little bit? I think I'll come bit? back a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I don't think we want to incarcerate that side branch at all. Yeah. You got lots of room to work, lots of room. Yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead, give it a test. You don't have to send any all these. Puff. Or you can if you want. <laughs> Just tad back more. Just a back a tad more. Just a tad. Okay, that's great. Why don't you go up there too? So the nominal on this is uh, 11 with a rated burst of 16. I think we'll just go up to nominal. Go up two, four, six, eight, ten, and 11. Yeah, that looks that looks big. Good. And down. So. Bimmel, looking at this angiographically, you still want to go with a 4-0 here? You know, uh, I, I tend to trust what my imaging oh, tells me. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Let's take a picture of this and sure. see. Uh, I, in fact, I, uh, let's take a picture and make sure that we've got flow down uh, all of the, the, down the main branch and then all the side branches like we want. Well, it looks beautiful. Holy and you man. know what I'll tell you is you, you can always undo something that you went a little less on. Mm -hmm. If you over dilate, you know, you really can't take that back. And you've got the OCT catheter still on, on, on deck. So, you, you know, if you wanted to use a 3.5, go to high pressure, re-image, see what the expansion there is. And if you're under expanded by more than 10%, then go a little bit more aggressive. So you're you making well. the argument under that circumstance for 
uh, multiple uh, imaging runs. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. All right, I would say let's go with a 3.5 non-compliant balloon, and then let's see what our percent under expansion is. Exactly. Right, we're, we're really, uh, with this case, we're really doing uh, what I would say is uh, the basics of imaging. Uh, I, I think we don't do enough imaging, uh, and so we're committed on SIF virtual. This year, we said we're really going to go. We're really going to go back to the basics of imaging and explain every step of the way. And that's what Bimmel does so remarkably well. Uh, I think this is extremely important. And if we're not imaging well in excess of 50% of our cases, I, I I think we're not doing the best for our patients necessarily. I absolutely agree. You know, the the interesting thing about this case is when you do a lumen to lumen measurement, there there are two kind of factions. There's ones that trust completely doing immediate to media mm -hmm. and then downsizing. Mm -hmm. There, uh, I come from a, a, a school with Dr. Bezerra who loves to do the lumen. And the reason he likes to do that sometimes is if there's a centric plaque and, mm -hmm. and you over dilate a little bit, mm -hmm. you're gonna end up with a dissection there. So he tries to, um, you know, it, that type of strategy may lead to one or two more balloons, maybe one extra run of OCT, but maybe safer. I just think the information, uh, you and I talk about this all the time, the information that you get from OCT, I don't think it's uh, too strong to, uh, to uh, have labeled what we're doing here as absolute uh, precision PCI. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, to me, being in the lab is such a, a fun and wonderful and rewarding experience that I, I don't think we should be in a hurry to get out of the lab. And taking that time to do the extra imaging run uh, is rewarding for us, but more importantly, it leads to better outcomes. Yeah. Nobody can argue that it doesn't lead to better outcomes. Yeah. You know, in uh, our light lab study, looking at efficiency with OCT, with, with some novice users, we find that it adds no more than 10 minutes if it's gonna add. And the idea is once you become more seasoned with using imaging, it's actually gonna um, help with timing. That's great. Okay, so I say, you, did you take a picture? I was no, too busy talking. No, OCT. Okay, let's OCT it. Uh, and let's see what, we, uh, what we've learned from OCT. And we really haven't given that much contrast. Uh, we've uh, been uh, very uh, conscious of contrast. The other thing we did at the beginning of the case, you recall, we gave several boluses of saline. You know, with all of the things that we've talked about, bicarb and N-acetylcysteine and all the, the various uh, cocktails that have been tried to prevent contrast-induced nephropathy, to me, the thing that absolutely works the best and it's a time-honored therapy is giving saline. Giving a bolus of saline, he's got really preserved LV systolic function so he can tolerate a couple of saline boluses and this really does go a long way uh, to uh, protecting uh, the kidneys. Maybe while he's setting this up, give us 60 seconds on the Light Lab project. This has been a great project yeah. and a, there's a number of participating centers. Yeah, so um, Savani, how many centers? 12. 12, so we have 12 centers um, nationwide um, and it's an OCT imaging study, mm -hmm. basically looking to see how we can make um, uh, using imaging more efficient at uh, sites. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is then uh, after these um, centers that are doing it, once we have data of how to make it most efficient, we can go to other sites and, and show them how to do precision PCI, save time, maybe also make an economic impact as well. That's great, that is great. All right, I think we're ready. Why don't we clear the catheter, make sure we're in good shape, clear the catheter, go ahead. And you don't need to do this under cine, I would just do this under fluoro. All right, let's let the uh, injector fill. Okay. Oh, that's a beaut. Great. Okay. Now, one of the things while they're uh, uh, setting this up for review, one of the things that you can see that we use is the 
uh, automatic injector, the assist device. At first, I didn't know how I was going to feel about this, but once we made the conversion, I've been hooked on the use of the assist device. And look at, you know what, look at during the course of our procedure, how the pressure has gone from a baseline of 80, we've revascularized, look at the pressure now, 140 or 138 uh, over, uh, over 90, the, the pressure, he is held hemodynamically stable throughout this entire thing. I think one of the problems that we were seeing early on was that, you know, he had high grade uh, disease and everything we did was, uh, you know, injecting contrast and that whatnot yeah. uh, intensified his ischemia. And now he's far more hemodynamically stable. Okay, what are so, we seeing? So uh, we've got our co-reg all set up. We got a longitudinal view and you have the stent there and, and uh, the lower view there. Mm -hmm. And what you see at the distal edge uh, of the stent, um, you see that the, even though the vessel is diseased, it's widely open, and there is no evidence of a, a major or a minor dissection there distally. Okay. And then as we play through the image, we're going to um, jump to the proximal edge of the stent, which is going to be within the previous stent. So we'll, we'll try to find um, that segment if we can. Um, it's around there. And, um, and again, uh, we're within a stented area that this area had some degree of neo-intimal hyperplasia, so we don't necessarily ex expect to find any dissections there. So, so that looks great. And then what we'll do, because the software is picking up the old stent, we'll put our markers where the new stent was placed. And we know the length of our stent, which was uh, 24 millimeters. And then we'll look at what expansion the software is giving us. So in the distal edge of the stent, our expansion is 101%, uh, which is excellent. In the proximal part of the stent, there is an area in that mid portion that's 57% expanded. And so um, the proximal reference segment was a 4-0, so what I would uh, recommend doing based on this data, you want to try to get to 80% or better right. expansion to lead to better outcomes. Uh, hopefully our Lumion uh, line of, uh, of uh, studies as well as Lumion 4, which are looking at clinical outcomes, will lend credence to this. Uh, but I would use a 4-0 in that proximal to mid-segment, um, and then we should be done. The proximal to mid-segment is partially old stent, partially new stent, correct? It's... Um, uh, overlap, yes. It's overlap. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, good. All right, let's do this. Um, we're going to get a 4ONC uh, emerge out here. And I think we'll do this, and then we won't have to do necessarily another IVUS run. I think we have enough, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. enough data. Yeah. Uh, tell me one more thing. Uh, how much, if you're concerned about contrast induced nephropathy, you have someone with a borderline GFR or creatinine. What are you doing in terms of non-contrast use in OCT? Well, so uh, my further statements are off-label. Okay. Um, you can, um, I've tried to use saline itself mm -hmm. in using it. Um, at times it, it works just fine. Okay. Um, I've not used anything more viscous. You need some degree of viscosity with OCT. Um, if I'm trying to what limit my contrast, blood? I've heard people using blood, just you, drawing blood up. And you can the... draw blood and just mix it with saline Correct. and see if you get a better, um, you Discussing. may get more s swirl in that okay. case. Right. And then obviously, you know, IVIS imaging works as well. And if you need to limit contrast use, um, and you had prior, uh, angiography and you want to stage a procedure, we've done many, um, non-contrast, uh, PCIs with just IVIS guidance. Mm -hmm. So IVIS is not failure of uh, diagnostics in your mind? No. <laughs> Correct. All right, so we've done a 4 ONC now. Let's do a final angiogram in both the cranial and caudal angulations, and let's see what we have. Uh,
Oh, that's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Uh, do me one favor in this view. Let's just pull our wire back to uh, about that diag. Let's just make sure that spasm goes away. Pull the wire and the LED back slightly. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Right there, right there. Go ahead and uh, take a quick picture there. Let's just, I want to see what that distal looks like. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd leave that alone. I think that's going to recover fine. We can throw some nitrates down the vessel uh, when we go off camera, and, but I think uh, that's just going to be all uh, wire-induced um, uh, spasm. And then let's do something in the call of view. I always do that just to make sure, sure. that yeah. things proximally in the circ and whatnot have, yeah. Uh, yeah. that we've not uh, lost anything there. A little damped. Yeah, a little damped. Did you pull all the wires back? Yeah. Okay. And let's just take a, let me just take a puff here, a little puff. Yeah. And we're good. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Why don't you pull back? That's great. There you go. All right. I'm going to let you mm -hmm. put the wire in, and uh, great work. Thank Good you for job, taking man, over. I Thank was you. exhausted there doing all the heavy lifting. Okay. Uh, final comments. You know, uh, when, whenever you have a case of a previously stented segment, now I'm obviously a proponent of using image guiding on most of my cases. However, when you have a stent failure case, whether it's thrombosis or restenosis, you are obligated to image and figure out, you know, why that occurred, and that may dictate what your next steps are. Yeah, that's, that's really a great point. You have to understand in a non-diabetic, uh, this shouldn't have happened, or we, it's, it's not as common, and I think you're obligated to diagnosing what the issue was, why you have an instant, uh, in a, what should have been a, you know, a drive-by durable PCI. I, I, would, I would say this to, um, uh, to, our, uh, uh, to our viewers, to me, we don't do enough imaging. Now, we are obviously committed uh, as an imaging center. We have a heavy emphasis on OCT, but also on intravascular ultrasound. I think this, uh, some of the lessons from this uh, case and from other cases that you and I have recently done is that utilizing OCT uh, for uh, even left mains as long as it's not osteoleth main, gives a ton of information and is a reasonable undertaking. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this was really uh, OCT 101. This wasn't necessarily advanced placement OCT, although the way you describe things, it's just spectacular. I learned something from it more each time. We would strongly urge, uh, strongly urge that if you're not imaging, that you begin to image that if you need to get your clinicals from um, Abbott for OCT, that you do it. If you need to get your clinical uh, support uh, team from, from other companies for intravascular ultrasound, that you do it. But there is nothing that benefits our patients more than advanced high-resolution imaging-guided uh, coronary intervention. And I think this case is a, just a beautiful example. So we thank you for joining us for uh, this edition of SIF Virtual, and we look forward to bringing you more cases in the near future. Thank you for joining us. Thanks.